The question is, what conditions might intelligent creatures elsewhere in the universe have in common with us and our own earthly systems, be they social, cultural, and economic? For the purpose of this presentation, we'll define intelligent alien civilizations as those who have the advanced technology to communicate with us, either by radio waves or laser pulse, or those who might visit us here in person, so to speak. We'll use reason suppositions to help us form some hypotheses. Astrophysicists apply laws of gravitational waves universally to the cosmos. Astrobiologists make suppositions about possible life forms on other worlds that they'll likely be carbon-based and live on watery planets, for example. So what we'll do in this session is apply some of what we know about the development of civilizations and cultures and see what we might pluck out and apply intra and intergalactically. And as most academes do, we'll start with a review of existing facts. My doctoral work is focused on developments of sociocultural systems and socioeconomic systems on this planet, those systems developing with significant cultural differences from one another of peoples around the world as we evolved in comparatively isolated geographies and isolated generations. My research asked, how might we identify and quantify those cultural differences, and ultimately, how might we transcend those differences, particularly in international settings and relations? And in this presentation, we'll consider how this same sort of research and reasoning might be applied to other civilizations on distant worlds, those that have also evolved in isolation from our own field of reference, and perhaps under similar forces. Now, some may fear that reaching out to alien civilizations is not a very good idea that in spite of the alien advanced technologies that may have got them here, they might hunger for the rich offerings of our planet. Steven Spielberg has spent many movies on this theme, and he says in his heart he believes that any visiting aliens would not be sinister, that they've come a long way just to eat us for lunch or to drain our oil. And there is a precedent for alien encounters and how we react to them. When European sailors first navigated a course to the Japans, both sides felt an alien encounter was underway, perhaps a new world to exploit. We readily expanded our understanding of the world and our place in it, and we added some new food to our menu. And this topic is never too far from our minds, aliens on the horizon. There have been plenty of headlines about communicating with aliens prior to the big one yet to come of contact made. And note that these are mainstream, respectable media, not sensational gossip rags, Reuters, New York Times, National Geographic among them. Here's the cosmology you've likely seen that this is a conservative astronomical reference for estimating the number of stars and planets in our universe. There are some 50 billion visible galaxies in the universe. The Milky Way is but one of those. And a conservative estimate of 100 billion visible and not visible uh, galaxies. A conservative estimate of 100 billion stars per galaxy makes 100 billion times 100 billion or 10 sextillion stars in the universe. The uh, International Astronomical Union estimates some 70 sextillion stars. A conservative estimate of one in a million stars with orbiting planets, one planet per star system, equals 10 million billion possible planets out there. And with a conservative estimate of one in a million planets supporting life, that equals 10 billion life populated planets in the universe. And of course, we're looking for intelligent life capable of sending us a text message. 
The Hubble uh, Space Telescope has snapped a deep field image of a chunk of the sky, including at least 10,000 galaxies, which is a very small sliver of what all is out there. Uh, based here in California, uh, here is one of my favorite galaxies. I'm a big fan of Mexican food. And here's a photogenic galaxy that seems to be looking back at us, the Eye of God galaxy. And here is a snapshot of our home system, obviously not to scale. Our solar system includes the nine planets orbiting our sun of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and uh, no Pluto in this picture. In order to bear life, an Earth-style planet has to be in the so-called Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right. In other words, you'd have to be close enough to its star to have liquid water, yet not so close that its oceans would boil away, and not so far that its oceans would deep freeze. So how many planets might also provide a suitable home for advanced life forms capable of communicating with us? And in this famous Drake equation, n equals the number of planet civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy that may be capable of radio communications. And astronomer Dr. Frank Drake estimates n at approximately 10,000. Carl Sagan uh, revisited the Drake equation and raised the estimate to a million advanced alien worlds possible in the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy. Since the cosmos holds hundreds of millions of galaxies, by that analysis, the total number of alien societies could be astronomical, one estimate putting uh, the number at roughly 10 trillion. On the other hand, we have the rare earth hypothesis. Uh, Peter Ward and uh, Donald Brownlee propose conditions suitable for complex life may be very rare throughout the universe, a reason that we haven't had any contact. And that could be uh, if the rare earth hypothesis is right, well, we've only wasted some dreams. If wrong, we have left ourselves unprepared. And here's another reason why we may not have had contact yet. If there are so many of them, why don't they just say hi? Well, the first radio broadcast of Human Voice on Earth was December 24, 1906. So we're still infant, uh, infants on the uh, radio airwaves. Uh, SETI, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, has been seeking space radio signals only since 1960. So we've been looking for less than a human lifetime. The Milky Way galaxy is some 100,000 light years wide. So that means it takes 100,000 years for a message traveling at the speed of light to reach us from the other side of the galaxy. Our nearest neighboring galaxy is the Andromeda Spiral, which is 2 million light years away, or 20 times as long for a radio wave to reach us as the farthest reaches of our own galaxy. We may have already heard from them. The WOW signal was received at the Big Ear Radio Observatory at Ohio State University in 1977. It was 30 times stronger than the background noise of the universe. And it was coming from where astronomers expected to find alien signals and within the predicted radio spectrum. It lasted for 72 seconds, then went silent. And, of course, if it was just a shot in the dark spread across the universe, it wouldn't have lingered long, like a lawn sprinkler sprays across the field. Perhaps they have taken notice of us, but just not found us very interesting. Consider how primitive our own people from just a century or two ago would appear to us now. No telephones, no TV, no radio, no smartphones, no virtual worlds. Now imagine how we might appear to aliens looking in, millennia more advanced than we. How might alien civilizations view our technology? How might we even view ourselves if we visited just 100 or 200 years into our past, or even 50 years? 
primitive, perhaps, but yet interesting. Few of us would probably want to go and live there. We'd well want to change them, perhaps, in violation of a prime directive. Or maybe simply based on the numbers, they've determined the tardigrade is the dominant life form on this planet. There are millions and millions of them for each one of us. And tardigrades are just so cool. Look at all they can do. They can live in space. They can go 10 years without water. They have a mass of neurons functioning as a brain. And that's pretty much us too, our, our neurons functioning also as a brain. And even we are overwhelmed by the vast array of species that share our planet. Most of them we haven't even met yet, especially those living in the deep. So where might we best meet other civilizations in the universe? In a Journal of Science article, two Australian astronomers wrote that they have pinpointed an area of the Milky Way that is most likely to support alien life. There's a few billion stars out there in what they call the galactic habitable zone, which has the appropriate conditions to support complex life. The article says if there is life out there, this is most likely where we are to find it. Of course, it is presumptuous to say with any degree of certainty what we might find in alien civilizations, but it is possible to consider what we should look for, the characteristics we might share in common. For example, what forces or powers push a civilization onward to advanced stages of development? Here's a very brief and select overview of biological, psychological, and social evolutionary thought. Charles Darwin and his progeny, such as E.O. Wilson, described biological and sociological human development in evolutionary terms and in terms of evolutionary behavior, and they call that sociobiology. That our physical and social constructions have been selected according to their survival value. Traits which enhance our chances of survival are retained and encoded. Less suitable traits are typically extinguished on the competitive battlefield of Darwinian selection. In stark contrast to that, anthropologist Ashley Montague strenuously and at times derisively challenged Wilson's thesis and claimed instead that human development process has been one of intellectual folding beyond reductionist processes of sociobiological mutation and adaptation. Montague proposed the guiding mechanism of development is one of intelligence or a matter of brain over biology. Psychologist Carl Rogers observed that regardless of the motivational forces and evolutionary mechanisms, all human, indeed all organic development, especially in the psychological realms, is an irresistible drive that will inevitably find its way. Another psychologist, Abraham Maslow, said our development follows a path pursuing a hierarchy of needs ranging from physiological needs, safety needs, belongingness and love needs, esteem needs, peaking with a drive for self-actualization crowned by the oceanic experience. And these are all forces that may be at play throughout the universe as they are here on Earth. As above, so below, says Hermes. And here is how some exobiologists and sci-fi artists have envisioned aliens may appear. Seth Shostak, the senior astronomer at the SETI Institute, talks of a mechanism known to biologists as convergent evolution. And let me quote him here. Convergent evolution argues for at least a bit of resemblance as nature works its way down a Darwinian path with natural selection of good designs that enhance survivability. 
He says that humans in many ways are a reasonably functional design for a technically sophisticated creature. But it's a bit extreme to maintain that an intelligent alien will look like your brother-in-law. After all, an extra set of arms might be useful, as would an eye in the back of our heads, and extra fingers for playing the piano better. He is convinced there is intelligent life out there. He said if any aliens share the same carbon-based organic chemistry as humans, they would probably have a central processing system, eyes, a mouth or two, legs for locomotion, and some sort of reproduction. But Shostak says that any intelligent extraterrestrial life may have grown light years beyond the intelligence of man. What we are more likely to hear from will be so far beyond our own level that it might not even be biological anymore, but some artificial form of life, he says. Here is a little more on convergent evolution. It simply means that certain characteristics evolve in common with other species, simply because they're a good idea. Notice the giant armadillo of North America, and the giant pangolin of Africa, and the giant anteater of South America, and the spiny anteater of Oceania. They may look similar, but it's not because they're close relatives. Instead, they've evolved similar adaptations serving a survival advantage because they occupy similar niches in nature, dining on ants, hunting in the high grass, or swimming in the dark, although their evolutionary origins are quite different from one another. Dolphins and barracudas look similar in silhouette even though they evolved from very different forebears. Their adapted hydrodynamic shapes are the result of convergent evolution. Uh, here is a quote from the Encyclopedia of Astrobiology, Astronomy and Spaceflight. The frequency with which convergent evolution has occurred on Earth supports the idea that certain basic anatomical structures and physiological mechanisms might be common among life forms throughout the universe. What evolutionary characteristics we might have in common, at least physically, with similar species on other worlds, and how might we milk that for common cultural and sociological insights, which is the question now before us. And all the energy and matter of our universe started with a Big Bang. That's a fairly recent understanding in the history of humanity. We all come from common seeds, so it's reasonably expected we may not be all that different from one another on other worlds. The laws of physics and evolution and socialization springing from a single atom, something that the Hindus hinted at millennia ago. Other world religions in their earliest creeds also have hit close to the mark. In Genesis, we were an empty void without form until someone hit the light switch. Or the Hindus, day and night of Brahma, a universe alternating between potentiality and expression. Or the Taoists, who refer to an undifferentiated reality from which the universe evolved. Some cultures and nations on Earth are more developed than others. Some are older than others, yet we all come from the same seeds. Our apples don't fall far from the fruit tree. We are all ripples from the same source, to mix metaphors. So if we share common soil and seeds, it wouldn't be too surprising to find we have a common resonance in our core. So when we do connect, just how much information can we exchange and how might we do it? For example, Carl Jung identified certain archetypes that transcend cultural differences, such as the universal theme of a paradise or golden age. He says that universal resonance to particular themes and symbols may reside in a collective consciousness. And these archetypal themes include the creation of the cosmos, the symbolism of rebirth, the hero in battle to rescue the distressed, 
sexual images of fertility, symbols of transcendence and release, and so forth. Joseph Campbell, in a treatment on the power of mythologies, suggested as well various images and themes that may be universally resonant as applied and passed on by storytellers and artists. Some of Campbell's ancient mythological themes include the mystery of death and life, the procuring of food, the transformation of children into adults, the relationship of the individual to the group, and so on. Even if these themes may be universally resonant, well, how do we convey them without a common language? And if we just send pictures, will they be understood? Well, we could send pictures, but even something so picture clear to us may be misunderstood by others. For example, we see a picture of an adult holding a child. Well, is that a parent who loves that child, or is it someone about to hurt that child, or even eat that child? There can be too much left unanswered by a photograph. One suggestion to get around the ambiguity of pictures is to send messages that portray objects in three-dimensional space, perhaps holographic sculptures that an alien can choose to view from any angle or using the vocabulary of dance and gestures and pointing to teach and convey information. The more information sent, the better for some sort of understanding. According to new calculations published by two scientists in the journal Nature, it is millions of times more efficient to send a long message as a physical package, a cosmic FedEx, uh, rather than as a radio wave or laser pulse. So as we now consider our communications, what images and themes might be universal, we may need to modify our concept of universal with our expanded understanding of just what that means. If we really want to say something is true all across the vast expanse of space and time, we may need to refer to it now as multiversal. For example, the universal assessment of facial expressions. One definitive study found a pan-cultural reaction among diverse cultures in response to photographs expressing a series of facial expressions. The study included participants in diverse countries and cultures, some who had never seen a movie or a TV show or magazine, and they all associated the same emotion with the same facial expression. Is there an evolutionary physiological foundation for facial expressions that we may share in common with other alien species, which include expelling, for example, a sour taste and disgust where the tongue pokes out and the face pulls back, or surprise where our eyes open wide to let in as much light as possible to fully assess the circumstance? or fear where the body recoils and retreat and the eyes open wide and the hands come up, or anger where the face tenses and the eyes focus on a target. There are biological reasons molded by evolutionary forces for the faces that we make. What sort of sociological scales might we use for assessing our differences and similarities? Some may object to Geert Hofstede's methodology, but his taxonomy has really stood the test of time, measuring cultural differences in terms of power distance, individualism, masculinity, uncertainty avoidance, and long-term orientation. It was my years I spent in Eastern Europe with a Slavic culture at a near polar opposite of my own culture from the United States that gave me my first inkling into the vast differences between peoples, but it also gave me the incentive to seek commonalities as I managed a Russian news team. My research into bridging cultural differences has been published in scholarly journals. You can find a link to my UNESCO article uh, on my website, research website at www.mr.us. Since 2000, I have taught students, now in the thousands, from more than 40 different countries. Here are some of my students at UCSB and UCLA, 
And I'm always looking for better ways to bridge differences across wide cultural gulfs. And the first thing to figure out is what causes dissonance, discord, even warfare among our human species. Extrapolating these traits to alien relations, it may be best to avoid telling jokes, for example, which are so culturally contextual, or hitting on them sexually, or trying to convert them to the true faith, or implying that our planet has the best of all political systems as we try to win their vote. Instead, we might consider what themes and images create a resonance between diverse cultures. For example, aliens most likely will have some means of perpetuating themselves, so they may well tenderly care for their offspring. No doubt, when we finally learn to communicate fully with dolphins, They'll tell us stories about their children, the games they play, conflicts with other dolphins, their rituals of birth and death, and certainly they'll have lots to say about water. Now, planets within our own galaxy may be most like ourselves. We share roughly the same cosmic time frame and astronomical dust, and given the vast expanse of space, we live just next door to other star systems. So how might some of the traits of our Earth apply, and what traits may be transgalactic among the vast differences that might exist between worlds? So let's look at some of the possibilities. Reproducing and preserving life is a big one. If a species didn't reproduce, eat, survive, it wouldn't evolve very far. And that's liable to be as common of a universal or even multiversal theme elsewhere as it is on Earth. If alien species do reproduce, do they have family issues? Do they mate? Do they retain familial ties? What would the image of a parent and child serve, possibly as an effective means of trans-species communication? It's hard to imagine advanced species that didn't interact in social structures. Specialization of labor is an important component of technological development. How do they interact with each other? Social networks of common interest or professional organizations. Do they have clubs and circles of friends? Do they celebrate arts and music? Do they attend churches? Viktor Frankl wrote that much of human development is based on a search for meaning, a sense of purposefulness. Do they have a purpose, a meaning, a reason for being, a motivational force, a recognition of something greater than themselves? Might we find some commonalities within our own world religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Wicca? And how can a civilization survive if not somehow coordinated with the environment, its production of food and protection of non-renewable resources and viability of ecosystems such as water, air, or other biologically life-sustaining systems? And how are environmental systems governed and protected in the common good? How are economic systems governed and coordinated? What ensures defense systems. And if they do have specialization of abilities, how are those abilities exchanged? Is there a socialist organization or a free market system? Is technology advanced to the point where all needs are met? If so, what is done with their free time? What motivates their participation in a social structure? And while alien species may not necessarily be aggressive or warlike, it is safe to assume that they would be able to defend themselves against attack. One group of scientists predicted their weapons load would be light if they came to us because of weight restrictions in space travel, so we may not need to worry about an attack from them. Some theorists say the uh, theme of altruism is a logical starting point for finding common ground. Dr. Uh, Douglas Vakoch, who is a resident psychologist at SETI, suggests a notion of reciprocal altruism in which you pick bugs out of my hair and I give you a banana later.
He says, it seems plausible that if other beings are sending a transmission, in a sense, they are practicing altruism, investing considerable resources, as we are, perhaps in the hope of getting a message and information back in return someday. And that sense of sharing is something we might share. So that is my own feeble attempt at paving the way to the universal or multiversal commonalities that intelligent species might use as a start at communication. Some people say we may have already encountered aliens or that they have encountered us, but it's been kept secret. And perhaps we do need to consider that groups of people are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, as we see here on this slide. Something strange, uh, unknown powers can threaten a group, and it's e only practical and even essential that such a situation evokes an instinctive panic response. And that's where reason and leadership come in. So we shouldn't panic. These are wise words uh, from Douglas Adams. We are once again on the verge of transformational change on our world, where the abundance provided by technology may downgrade the often polarizing roles of economics and politics and dogma. And we as educators and scientists and just well-intentioned, informed people can help prepare the way, influencing other mindsets by ensuring that our own are set right. And others are very receptive to our sympathetic influence. One of my students said when she travels internationally, she leaves her know-it-all face at home and instead wears a face of humility and questioning. And she finds herself even more welcomed because of it. And this image is known as the Blue Marble. It was taken by the Apollo 17 mission in the 70s. NASA says that even today, it is the single most requested image in their archives. And seen from space, our planet looks so inviting and vibrant, unified, even peaceful. It's the face we turn to the universe. So let's wear a face of humility and curiosity, and we may find a new and wider welcome to the cosmos. And thanks for listening. Feel free to send me an email with any thoughts or updates, and uh, I look forward to communicating with you.